thank you. And thank you, Chita-san, for introducing the Nikita survey and in particular introducing some of my slides, which you'll find very similar from New Zealand. Um, I actually have a question for Chita-san, which we might discuss at the end of my talk, which addresses this issue of the uh, artifacts at the edges of a 3D inversion. So I'll let you think about that as we get closer to the end of my talk and uh, I'll ask the question then. But um, my talk is a little broader than just NT. I'll be looking at uh, a wide range of geophysics and, uh, and looking at the usefulness of this geophysics and, uh, and, and other approaches and modeling in particular to assessing a supercritical geothermal resource to potential. And um, so my talk will cover what is the deeper and hotter roots of the underlying parts of the volcanic geothermal systems in both New Zealand and both in uh, Iceland and Japan, of course, uh, well known for. The, uh, we'll address some of the heat transfer processes in those very deep roots, and we'll look at what is the motivation for this work. It seems very difficult to drill to these depths. It's going to be very expensive. Why do we do it? And uh, well, the reason, of course, is that potentially we could get much greater energy than that, or from the wells that the the supercritical I'll also talk about examples of ongoing research um, using uh, some kind of uh, integrated um, technology and, uh, in the deep roots area, and I'll give some examples from New Zealand, some of which you've already seen in the previous talk. Um, others, I also will give you perhaps one or two slides at the end other examples around the world on uh, deep roots research. Uh, first of all, some, some fundamental um, science, and uh, of course, if you're not familiar, if you're an engineer, you're familiar with this, um, the uh, temperature versus pressure plot, which shows the critical point, which is at about 374 degrees and 280 bars, and in pure water, this is where you get supercritical fluid. And uh, in these supercritical conditions, they're going to exist somewhere down near the bottom part of our conventional geothermal reservoir. They are difficult to explore. They exist in thermoelastic elastic rock mechanical properties. In other words, this region where the rock is uh, going through a transition from brittle to ductile behavior. And, and theoretically, you should not get too many fractures where you've got ductile behavior. But we um, talked a little bit about that. And this again is a cartoon to illustrate um, the, the uh, area that we're looking at in terms of the temperature up near 400 degrees. This is our conventional geothermal system and temperatures of, uh, up to about 350 degrees where there's convecting geothermal fluids. And we want to know whether we can access some of the very high temperature resources at these depths where it's accessible, where it's economic to drill. And the main heat sources could be deep-seated magma chambers, it could be cooling protons, or they could be smaller intrusions, consisting of dike, vertical uh, channels of uh, vertical conduits of magma, or silts, or something. And uh, what is the challenge for, for exploring the deep roots of our uh, existing geothermal systems? Well, we need to know what are the heat sources, we need to know the deep magma chambers, what are they zones of partial melt in these dikes or cells. We need to know, does the heat transfer, uh, how does this heat transfer up into the reservoirs occur? Is there enough deep permeability to, uh, for extraction from deep wells? Can we stimulate that deep permeability by cooling the rock, causing it to contract and for fractures to form? And uh, are there supercritical conditions that uh, durable depths, and is this fluid at high temperature or high pressure a potentially corrosive chemistry with hydrochloric acid can that be utilized in the soda? So those are our challenges. And what is the relevance to this work? Well, the relevance is that we can potentially get much greater output, perhaps as much as five times the normal output from these wells. It also extends our resources vertically rather than laterally, so we can potentially get a lot more energy. Greg uh, mentioned this before. Um, very quick news on about the potential resource in the couple of volcanic zone at three to five kilometers deep. It's, uh, it's, it's huge. In principle, we should get less environmental effects from extracting energy from the deeper roots of these geothermal systems. 
And uh, there's a potential for applying reinjection production ductlets or uh, EGS type technology with the permeability is limited. But there's also a potential for reinjecting deep into these systems for the biokilometers and extracting fluids from shallow areas out of that, uh, that injection. So those, uh, those are the targets, that's our plan for what we're looking for. And uh, another important process to remember is that uh, permeability or fractures in rocks are not constant, they, they, they will change as a result of cooling and as a result of uh, microseismicity. And uh, we need to understand why is the heat transfer from these hot intrusions and magna into geothermal systems so rapid? Uh, and the reason, of course, is that the cooling water that comes down from near surface goes into the, and migrates or goes into the hot water through fractures. They open up by contraction, cooling contraction, and the energy that is derived from the cooling is transported up to the like beach. So that's the overall principle. And uh, in New Zealand, we have um, uh, some research, offer and deeper geothermal resource uh, integrated research, covering a wide range of of uh, techniques and technologies. There's some work in seismicity, led by these people. There's work in magnetic tolerance, just heard about some of that. Gravity and magnetics modeling. Um, there's 3D geological modeling. We're looking at the gray wacky basement. And there's uh, looking at stress determinations from uh, acoustic waterhole logging, the reservoir simulation modeling, and ductile zone events. So those are some of the, some of the research themes or topics that um, I'll be talking about today, but we don't yet have any deep drilling to those sort of depths below three point five kilometers. That's what we would like. Um, I just want to point out this is a paper by uh, some colleagues of mine at GNS and uh, from the US Newman, which essentially says a similar story to what we heard from Uchita san uh, in one of his slides. He mentioned that in a complex 3D environment, it's important to analyze the full MT and Venus schemes up. And uh, that means not just the two uh, XY X components of the tensor, but the full block diagonal components and diagonal components. And, um, and when you do that, there are challenges. And the reason for the, for the challenges is that there is a noise component in the Venus tensor, and it varies with the orientation. And so you need a very, a very experienced modeler to do your 3D modeling for you. Because they need to know how to assess these noise estimates in the data and to apply what they call weights to the components in order to get a nice smooth inversion. So remember that when you ask someone to do a 3D inversion. You need someone with experience, particularly in this late, uh, later stage of the modeling. And this is a, a, an image of some of the results of the modeling that uh, Gita Sun showed us. Uh, and this is a remote power field with a fluid underneath it, a hacky field with an inclined fluid underneath it. That just gives you a brief example. I don't have to dwell too much on that. And, uh, but I will go back to another paper that was published in the World Geothermal Congress just uh, last year, discussing 3D seismic velocity and continuation. But one of the things we're doing in New Zealand is looking at comparing uh, the 3D seismic work been going on, looking at properties of rocks that you can get from the seismic data with the MT, and seeing if there are some analogies. And so I'll show you some examples of how that integration from the two techniques can be very powerful, very useful for in interpreting the uh, deeper roots of our geothermal fields. So this, um, this work looked at the seismic properties in the depth range of 2 to 8 kilometers within the same area that the MT, detailed MT survey was done, about 30 by 50 square kilometers, uh, kilometers and uh, covering those geothermal fields. Um, and the data set was quite significant, up to uh, more than 120,000 differential travel time measurements. So if you can understand that, uh, I'll show you in the cartoon soon, but there are essentially large numbers of rays or pathways for the seismic waves to go from a source which might be an earthquake, it might be an explosion at the surface, to an instrument that records uh, travel time and arrival time. And by converting all that data together, you can produce a, an inversion model of the P wave velocity, the Q wave, the uh, shear wave velocity, the ratio of those two, and the attenuation. And it's the attenuation that I find fascinating when you think about seismic waves going through partially modern rock and through geothermal systems. 
It makes sense to think that some of these waves get attenuated and different in that way, different amounts. The shear wave doesn't propagate so well through liquids, um, partial melt, and so you get a, a variation of attenuation. And these these volumes, the anomalies in, your, in the attenuation, can show a high level of heterogeneity. They're not homogeneous. And these can be very useful. This information can be very useful when combined with the MT inversion to, um, to investigate the deep roots of our deep roots. Um, this is a reminder of what this, the earthquakes look like in this type of volcanic zone between Taupo, where I live, and uh, Rotorua in the north. The sector of the type of volcanic zone. When the earthquakes are relocated, that means they are located with an improved um, location uh, algorithm, which uh, is able to, uh, it's a difference they call it, which is able to produce a more accurate location. You see that the events do cluster, and uh, we find there are some lineation, so some fault zones, current fault zones, and some clusters around geothermal fields here in Botswana and uh, here at Wairaki. So we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later. And, and one of those areas, in fact, we'll just go back. Um, one of those areas of the river, our geothermal field, not far from where we were here, but uh, there are some reduced sizes. And uh, it's very interesting to look at the pattern of the seismicity that has occurred since this, this field started injecting fluids at this stage. So these are injection wells, these are production wells. The fluid is passing from the loft zones here at about two kilometers deep through, through the reservoir to the production zone. And there is a, a cluster or a grouping of the seismicity uh, along that flow path. And that has been it's continued for many years. So it's not a transient event that didn't just occur in the first few months of injection, it has continued. But what is most interesting from our point of view is that the seismicity stops at about four kilometers deep. And it's argued that this is because conditions up there are ductile at those depths. And the temperatures here are 330 to 340 degrees at the bottom of these wells. Ductile conditions are 400 degrees. We may have supercritical fluids somewhere at that depth range. So here at Motokawa, we could be uh, sitting on top of a very high temperature um, uh, system with uh, ductile conditions at 4 kilometers deep and some supercritical fluids just above that. <coughs> but we just come back from Rotokawa to uh, the Wairaki, the western field part of Wairaki, where uh, we heard earlier that there's been uh, uh, a long history of development and a, a new power plant has been built to meet you right on top of the upwind. This is where the production wells are, this is a cross section through the, from the northwest to the southeast, or west northwest to the southeast, from the main production area through to the main injection area. You can see the seismicity is clustered within the ball field and um, in, in the in basement rock, and uh, also along an inclined fault plane that appears to underlie the main upflow into the system. So it's argued that this is probably an indication of where the recharge is coming from, which has sustained the water in this field for more than 60 years, um, with 260 degree hot water coming in. Clearly, um, this is not ductile, there's brittle failure going on down there. Seven kilometers deep. Remember nearby the root carbon, no seismicity below four kilometers. Here we have seismicity going down to seven or eight kilometers and apparently marking a conduit which might be a recharge uh, conduit for hot fluids coming into the system. So this could be a very good target for future drilling if, um, if we, we need to replace some of the production coming from the shallow holes. Um, <coughs> So uh, at least uh, this map here shows the clustering seismicity around Wairaki, also the clustering seismicity uh, beneath the top of that top of, which is of course a map of the camera. Um, now I'm going to step into uh, a section of the talk which deals with um, understanding the deep roots of volcanic geothermal systems, which is a combination of some of this geophysical work that we've been dealing with. And the and, and modeling. Now we know that we had very high heat flux, 4,000 megawatts of heat comes to the surface in the type of volcanic zone. We know that it's the result of uh, subduction and drifting. And uh, it's also, we, we know that it's an extending zone, 16 millimeters per year of extension uh, across, the, across the type of volcanic zone in the coast. And we suspect that there are some 
So in the actual map, the need for the top of the is where imaging for the millimeter strokes. And that's what the computer is not showing us before. Fine. Now, what else do we know? Well, we know a little bit about the size and velocity structure. We know that the, um, there's a region here of relatively low velocity and uh, underplating, if you like, and about uh, 12 kilometers deep under the top of the volcanic zone. And we suspect that there are, there are regions of partial melt within dioxin and then silt in the zone between that deep and the what, what was interesting as an anecdote is that um, a couple of years ago there was a magnitude 6.3 earthquake directly underneath Talbot at 150 kilometers deep. We didn't feel it. People in Wellington who are 300 kilometers away felt it. And uh, the reason for that is because of all this soft stuff. It's attenuated the size of waves coming from the earthquake, which is on the South African plate at 150 kilometers. The size of waves coming up here. Which is of course directly above the epicenter. We did not feel it. So that's, a, that's an indication to us just from that observation alone that the, the material under here is relatively soft and very highly attenuated. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Warren Thistling, uh, attempted a full uh, uh, model um, of the large scale type of volcanic zone fluid flow model back in 2005. And he was looking at the time. And seeing if we can simulate the geothermal systems with, with, a, with a hot plate at, uh, at um, uh, an inflammable base at 8 kilometers deep, and then distributed heat sources at 10 kilometers scale. And uh, so he did that, but he had some failures, he couldn't get the temperatures to quite match. And um, there's been some improvements since then, I'll show you shortly what he's done in more recent times, but it's still work in progress, it's still work trying to research how to model, how to simulate the the uh, heat sources beneath the geothermal systems of this area. This is a representation I told you about that magnitude 6.3 earthquake that we didn't feel up there, but it's done many hundreds of kilometers away in, along the, uh, along the uh, Sadaki plate in Wellington. But um, this is the representation of the seismic conversion process that was done by Stephen Ballister and colleagues. And uh, so they were able to deploy a large number of instruments to, count, to get all these parameters, the velocities, and the attenuations um, in this group uh, of nebula the size of that they deployed. And uh, these were the red dots with the clusters of the micro earthquakes that were detected. You can see there's large numbers of them within the top few kilometers, the top five or six kilometers depth, and large numbers along the subduction plate. And by using a combination of those sources plus some active size sources, size of refraction sources, they were able to get through an immersion process a reasonable model of the subsurface. What is interesting, what is interesting about the result, well, you can see it's not uniform. These are the profiles through the area of interest, one, two, three, and this is the uh, Q, which is the inverse of the temperature. Right. And it's not beautiful. We thought there's a two dimensional world, cross sections across the top of the So we expect these to be layered when they're not. And, and that's the most important message. The attenuation is in the homogeneous, heterogeneous. You should always remember that it's not a two dimensional world, which reinforces what we heard from Chinese. We have to look at three dimensional inversion for all our data. This is in the NT 3D inversion, which we saw already. And the question here is, are these NT inversions consistent with an intrusion model of the type of volcanic zone heat source? Are uh, each of these geothermal systems uh, represented by separate uh, magma sources at these depths of so 6 to 8, 10 kilometers deep, with heat flowing up into the shallow parts of the system? Or is there a more consistent underplating of that? Later, very high temperature rock coming from the whole zone. Well, I want to show you again, this is a result that you've seen already before in terms of cross section from Rotorua through to Rotomahana uh, and uh, Waikapu geothermics, Waikapu geothermics. This is an example of the integration of seismicity, earthquakes, red drops, and MT inversion. So the MT inversion shows this red block. We heard already it was interpreted as a heat source. 
Martin Melton. They read the black dots show the earthquakes, and they seem to mark corridors or conduits between the heat source and the shallow geothermal systems. So it appears that we do have to get from the uh, upflows uh, into these geothermal systems, but it seems that the heat source is common. So that's a very important and interesting, interesting result. It's also interesting to note that the seismicity uh, is marked by this uh, form of mine. There's no evidence of it at the surface. There's very strong evidence of it in the interstate And this is another example we've seen already about Haki, where the upload appears to be confined. It's not directly underneath the system. So from the wells, you would think that the primary upload comes directly up to the surface. As we heard before, we share some of the upload is more likely to come from this direction based on this MP form. And this is a, an early attempt at modeling that process that one of his colleagues have been, um, have been trying to develop to see if they can simulate the upload of heat on an implied plane and an incident strategy of this. And this is a, another example of the MT data from Rotor Power in this case. The permanent with the uh, neighboring geothermal systems, they all have these clay gaps, conductive material. Right? And uh, in this case, we Rotor Power, we have third plates above this conductor underlying the main geothermal field here, yeah, the main uh, production zone. So this is argued, it is suggested that this is the source of heat that's coming out of the system. Um, and this shows a cross-section of what those earthquakes look like in detail when you look at constrained to a what we call a, a compartment or a sector within this reservoir that probably fault bounding the northern side of it and uh, the region of bounding the southern side. So this cluster of seismicity is obviously indicating a zone where Stress is being relieved by uh, small triggers inject injected flow, fluid flow from injection production. And as I said before, very little seismicity below 4 kilometers deep. So we suspect temperatures are above 400 degrees at that depth. Um, there's, there's other uh, geotechnical and geophysical data that's been collected in this region. This is an example of satellite data. In South Africa, and GPS, continuous GPS measurements, showing a zone of subsidence in the center along the axis of the top of the volcanic Both images here show this zone of, um, of um, subsidence or gradual um, deformation, vertical deformation. And if you look at the, uh, there's also areas of geothermal subsidence, I won't go into that today, but uh, they are they're not considered in this particular interpretation. What is being considered is what is the source of the deep substance, the broad wave, long wavelength along the center of the TVZ. And uh, some modelers have come up with a, uh, these authors, Hamling, etc., have come up with a model suggesting that this can be explained by the cooling of a rhyolitic magma at about six kilometers depth or deeper, perhaps, of this order. So 0 0.06 cubic kilometers per year magma cooling, and that would produce a heat loss of around 5,000 megawatts. And that is consistent with the value that we have measured near the surface, it's about 4,500 megawatts of heat loss across the top of the its zone. So it looks like that might be a reasonable explanation for the high heat flow in the central part of the uh, TBC. We have a cooling rhyolitic magma that is gradually causing this deformation revealed from the Another useful piece of information: the uh, the depths of the of the seismicity, and uh, from a, a, a natural swarm of earthquakes back in 1983, the, the, the modelling here suggests that the depth interpretation of these events suggested that it was cut off um, below about eight kilometres depth. And then remember, I told you that must be such soft material you can't feel the earthquakes from 150 kilometres depth because uh, it's it's not able to um, yeah, transmit seismic waves very easily. Uh, more recent information supports that. So we have the numbers of earthquakes and then against the depth here. 
and this suggests that again we have uh, few earthquakes in that depth range below about eight kilometers, and that is compared with the what I told you before of the network power, where that cutoff is, a, is about four kilometers or three and a half kilometers, and outside the GBZ that cutoff is ten to thirty kilometers. So what do we have? We have variable brittle duct gold depth conditions. So the depths change. Uh, across the PVC. And that's an important uh, piece of information for the help of our understanding where these high temperature um, supercritical resources might be. Um, on a regional scale, DHM models, this is just a, a cross section showing how some of, some of our colleagues are also working with um, codes to simulate the deformation processes and the heat uh, flow processes. So there's a range of different models being considered, and uh, this is one of the more recent ones that uh, Warren Hissing has put together, showing that the locations of deep penetrating faults can make a big difference to the clues that arise from the uh, high temperature sources in the place uh, down the table of deep drilling. And uh, I won't talk about this in any detail, but it's just another example of information that's being collected using acoustic formation and they show variations in the orientation of the stress uh, direction with them, which suggests that there are some heterogeneity in the stress vectors as well. Um, finally, there's some quite a, a large range of projects around the world that are looking at deep roots. And in one of my roles in the IEA, International Energy Agency's Geothermal Implementing Agreement, is to assist with collaboration countries who are working in this area. So here's some examples of projects. I'll show you one uh, slide of this project in Italy, the East Ramble project in drilling and research in Switzerland. There's some development of, uh, of uh, code, of, uh, software to uh, investigate very high temperature exploration. In Iceland, there's a deep drilling project, a Upland drilling project. Of course, here in Japan, in New Zealand, our Hades project. And uh, underlying all this is a group collaborating group under the International Partnership in Geothermal Technology the Modeling Group, which includes at the moment these, uh, these countries looking at high temperature modeling. So there's quite a lot of work going on around the world, and we hope to uh, involve uh, Japanese colleagues in more of this um, high temperature um, supercritical condition work. This is the, the supercritical investigation that's been um, just starting in Italy called East Ramble. If you do a Google search and we do that, uh, Look at this website, you'll find out the details. Basically, they're going to deepen the existing well down to three or three and a half kilometers deep, and they expect uh, supercritical conditions. Now, also from the geophysics point of view, going to do some uh, seismic work, but it's mostly active seismic, so they can look at more, more closely what the uh, structure of the seismic structure is down the there. And uh, this is a quick introduction, just two slides to show what's happening in Iceland. They're looking at, also looking at high resolution seismic monitoring, the EMT and deformation monitoring, same as we are in New Zealand. They're looking at advancement of modeling methods, just like we are, into the high, high temperature conditions. And uh, they're looking at material selection, component design for wells, design of power plant and material recovery. So that's going on in Iceland. This is an example of a model that's been produced using high type 2 that's been adapted to, uh, to allow very high temperatures. And, and, and you can see the, uh, the development of a plume, the traditional plume with the sort of critical conditions at the bottom. And then my conclusion finally, well, it, certainly there's, a, there's an immense resource there, a huge amount of energy that uh, lies in these deep rooms. And that's because of the very high temperatures and the very high pressures. And uh, we don't really know uh, how much energy is there and how much we can extract. We just know it's very big. And potentially um, in Japan, we could access some of this resource too, provided it's economic, provided we do the research first to solve some of these problems. Up. What are the challenges? Well, we're not sure whether there's enough permeability for production. Could the deep reinjection be a feasible means of extraction? Uh, Bristol's back up transition to recording. And could we do that? Um, exploration methods are being upgraded to get better. Higher resolution and accuracy of these depths that we're talking about. 
The modeling and supercritical processes in the last scale regional modeling systems are improving, and collaboration between projects and countries has been very beneficial to date and should be further encouraged. So, the particular annex that I'm working in in the IEA Geothermal um, and is uh, called Deep Roots, and we certainly would like to see more uh, research collaboration. So, thank you very much. Thank you.